This morning, we will hear from Reverend Spearman, president of the North Carolina NAACP, Dr. William Darity Jr., director of the Samuel DuBose Center on, the Samuel DuBose Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University, Reverend Dr. William Barber, president of Repairs of the Breach, and Reverend Dr. Linda Lynch, president of the General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina. We'll have re opening remarks from Reverend Spearman. Dr. Darity will discuss the racial disparities that are emerging during this pandemic. Reverend Barber will give some details of the recovery plan. Reverend Lynch will give closing remarks, and then we will take questions from the media. Uh, Caitlin Swain, co-director of Forward Justice, and attorney Irving Joyner of North Carolina Central University School of Law, um, our counsel for the NAA, in North Carolina NAACP and repairs of the breach, and they will also be available for questions at the end. We are asking all reporters to please type your questions into the chat box, and we will get to you one by one at the end to answer your questions. So thank you all for joining us, and I will turn it over to Reverend Spearman to get us started. We need your You're on mute, Dr. sound. You're on mute, Dr. Spearman. Click off me. There we go. Here it goes. All right, let's try this again. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the, to the media who have assembled with us this afternoon. As Brittany has already stated, I am the Reverend Dr. T. Anthony Spearman, the president of the North Carolina NAACP, which is the second largest state conference in these United States and the largest among the Southern states with approximately 125 units adult branches and youth and college division chapters sprinkled throughout the 100 counties across this state. We have been carrying out the mission of our Valiant organization since the mid 1900s and we are not tired yet. We come this afternoon critically aware of how the COVID-19 pandemic is rapidly changing our world and we acknowledge that logically following from there is that our thought processes must also change in order to survive in this world. Otherwise, we are not going to survive. We must be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And although some are referring to this pandemic as an invisible enemy, which it very well may be, one truth that I cannot get away from is how the darkness that came with it is shining a tremendously bright light and bringing us into full view of an utterly broken democratic system whose disparities we have been shouting about for far too long. Racial disparities, economic disparities, health disparities, and disparities within this so-called democracy that accumulate and grow increasingly worse the more we ignore them. And right out of the stocks, I must admit to you that my stomach has been tied up in knots with how we've been dancing around the many issues that we presently face. We have turned to calling those who are out there on the front lines essential workers, yet governmental officials' refusal to expand Medicaid proves those workers have yet to become essential human beings. We put social distancing restrictions in place for some yet shrink back from doing the right thing by refusing to apply those social distancing restrictions to others, as in those in our correctional institutions. We come to magnify the limited choices and to amplify the silenced voices of the vulnerable and the victimized, 
the forsaken and the forlorn, those who are always caught in the margins, locked out of the policies that benefit the haves, but impoverish the have-nots. Policies that add to the lives of 1%, but take away from the lives of 99%. We cannot continue pushing these kinds of policies. Policies that will give an already wealthy senator the privilege to profit from the pandemic and become richer, while scores of others are left to make do with what they don't have. In advance of next week's legislative session, I, along with a few friends of mine, have come to address the moral crisis confronting our leaders. We need North Carolina's leadership to prepare a recovery plan that places those most affected at the center of attention of our policies. We come to outline pillars necessary to recover our moral capacity. Without these investments and restructuring, we will leave those most impacted triply burdened in the wake of this pandemic, deepening fissures and chasms that divide us. Economically speaking, we must have a special COVID-19 civil rights health and economic recovery office. Just as we have an office for underutilized businesses and veterans affairs and rural economic development. Two, fully resourced the North Carolina historically underutilized business office, mandatorily placing a, a HUB director at each office, establish a minimum $5 million loan to support small hubs with employees of 50 or less and direct state agencies that utilize the services of the state construction office and the state purchasing office to work with the hub office to identify construction, purchasing, and professional services contracts, $250,000 and lesser, to provide first consideration to small hubs. Three, we call on the governor's office in North Carolina General Assembly to work with economics to by June pass a significant raise minimum wage targeting first phase to essential workers. As it relates to health and safety, we must expand Medicaid to ensure persons tested can also get treatment. And we must five, provide health care to the poor who have pre-existing conditions that make them susceptible to the novel COVID-19 crisis. Six, we must have a clear coordinated strategy to ensure COVID-19 tests are provided to qualified health care systems, community health centers, and nonprofit providers servicing vulnerable communities in the state. Seven, we must commit to an expedited, clear targeted number to reduce North Carolina's incarcerated population because prisons are a petri dish and the infection of prisoners threatens both the entire population and those most vulnerable who are currently in prison. Just got word about the second death in our prison system this morning. A person serving a sentence in a system that already has disparate impact on poor people and people of color should not face a death sentence. We penned a letter to the governor on March 24th and signed off on two others and our requests have virtually gone unrecognized until this day. Thirdly, access to our democracy. Number eight, we must immediately act to provide funding support to ensure that all voters can participate in our dem democracy in 2020. Immediate steps necessary must include providing state match funds to release federal HAVA and CARES Act funding that North Carolina needs to respond to the COVID-19 crisis and to provide targeted education to voters on how to safely access the right to vote in 2020. Nine, to ensure that safe, equitable, in-person voting opportunities are still available for the full early voting period and election day in North Carolina. We must make election day a holiday, as they have in Virginia, 
allowing counties to large enough sites for safe in-person elections and update our poll worker recruitment tools and regulations. We also must ensure voters are not further disenfranchised who are already burdened by this crisis by suspending permanently any illegal photo voter ID requirement currently enjoined by the courts. And 10, to ensure that voters who need to can vote from home, we must mandate that every voter receives an absentee ballot request and assistance to participate in voting from home by allowing for voters to make the request by fax, email, or phone. Reducing the current witness requirement to accommodate the specific constraints of the COVID-19 crisis. Provide secure in-person drop-off opportunities for ballots and invest in prepaid postage for voting to ensure it is free. We come sounding the alarm because in these perilous times, we must change our ways of thinking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Spearman, and I'm glad to be on with Dr. Darity, and Dr. Lynch, Reverend Dr. Lynch. And Dr. Spearman has, has made it very clear, members of the media, something that we must address in this moment. We hear a lot about opening up the society, opening up the society, and the talk about the economy. But before we can open up the society, we must close these inequalities. We must close these uh, um, uh, fissures, as they call them. Most of the public health specialists, the, those that are, are not trying to kowtow to the narcissism in the White House or in the governor's mansion, um, um, will tell you that pandemics live, breathe, and exploit the fissures of society that pandemics have a biological and a sociological reality. Biologically, nature creates the germ. We, we don't have any control over that. But sociologically and economically, the pandemic will find its way to hosts that have already been facing enormous inequality uh, that have been created by race and have created by poverty and the criminalization of poverty. And it will exploit those fissures. It will it will host in those communities. Now, what the rest of society needs to know is that it will not stay in those communities. So unless we close the inequalities, we are all at risk. But unless we close and deal with those inequalities, those who are, uh, are hurt the most by those inequalities will die the most, will be impacted the most. North Carolina is in a situation where for years we have had a legislature that has taken us backwards and has opened more wounds and opened more fissures. And so I want to talk some about the reality of where we are. And in this moment, our current governor must recognize and recognize that the governor must be bold and we must demand when the legislature comes back to session next week that they care about all of us. We have a saying now in the poor people campaign. Everybody has a right to live, but we need to recognize in this moment, if they don't, we don't. And so right now in North Carolina, 48% of the people in North Carolina are poor and low income. That's 4.7 million residents. 56% of the children in this state. 62% of people of color are poor and low income. 39% of white people are poor and low income. Now, somebody might say, well, that means there are more whites than blacks. There are more blacks in poverty per capita as a percentage of race, but in raw numbers, there are actually 2.4 million poor whites in this country, in this state, and 2.3 million poor African-Americans, which may people of color, which means there are more poor whites in raw numbers. We also know that in this state that we have had intentional surgical racism in voting, specifically the court said it. The court said we have an unconstitutionally constituted legislature because of 
of a systemic and surgical racism. We also know that in this state, there are 35,000 plus people in prison. And we know that 61% are people of color. Black residents are incarcerated at over four times the rate of white residents. And that does not always mean, and it does not mean that African Americans are more criminal. There are a lot of factors that make up those numbers. And that's not even talking about the people who are waiting yet to even be tried. We also know that in this state, almost 181,000 veterans have incomes below $35,000. We know that in this state, there are 1 million plus people who are uninsured. And there are 32% of the census tracts in this state that are at risk for being unable to afford water. There are 9,000 people who are homeless, and in North Carolina, you can work. This is all prior to COVID-19. You could work a state minimum wage job, and it would take you 87 hours of work per week to afford a two-bedroom apartment. And we know before COVID-19, there were 2 million workers in North Carolina that made under $15 an hour under a living wage. That's 49.7% of the workforce prior to COVID made less than a living wage. And we know that North Carolina is at the bottom. We are 51st in unemployment payments because of the way the extremist legislature after 2013 chose to cut unemployment money. I wanted to lay out those facts so that the media understands why Dr. Spearman laid out 10 things that we must do. In other words, it is, will be a dereliction of duty by all of our leaders in a state that has 48% of its people living in poverty, in a state that has 49% of its workforce making less than a living wage, and in a state where people cannot pay, cannot afford a two-bedroom apartment unless they work plus 80 hours on a minimum wage job, it would be a dereliction of duty not to expand unemployment in the midst of COVID-19 and not to expand the minimum wage payments and living wage payments in the midst of COVID-19. Particularly when a lot of those workers are frontline workers, we call them essential and heroes, but heroes need more than a medal. If you're in combat, you get a, a combat raise, you get a combat bonus, and you get a GI Bill. Those on the front line, our nurses and doctors and the janitors and maids and garbage workers and fast food workers, if they are essential workers, then they are, if they are the front line, then we must do more than celebrate them as the soul of America. They must see the soul of this state and, and the state shows its soul by how it passes policies to increase their wages, make sure they have appropriate sick leave and unemployment. You cannot have a state where over a million people are uninsured and the legislature could come back and in 10 minutes next week, five minutes really, they could expand the Affordable Care Act and automatically 500,000 people that are uninsured now would be covered. And the money's been sitting there. The money's there. It doesn't require any raising of taxes or anything. It would be a dereliction of duty for the governor not to call for that and for the legislature not to follow suit. And, and, and to care for all of those who are uninsured, particularly the 500,000 that could be uninsured. And it should be noted that in raw numbers, 300,000 of those are white, 150,000 plus are black. And so we need to right now expand uh, Medicaid in this state. I wanna drill down on just two more. It would be a dereliction of duty in the midst of COVID-19. It was already a dereliction of duty before COVID-19, it would be even more to know that you have people in this state that can work two minimum wage jobs a week, 40 hours each one, and still not be able to afford a two bedroom apartment. It would be a dereliction of duty right now to not ensure that there is forgiveness for rent during the, the height of this uh, COVID-19 and a moratorium on basic household expenses and debt and loan forbearance and mortgages and rent and credit cards and utility bills and eviction 
particularly in a state where you already have 9,000 plus people who are homeless. And it would be a dereliction of, of duty if we do not address voting, as Dr. Spearman has outlined, and ensure uh, that people have free, unhindered access to the ballot, particularly in a state that has worked since 2013. The state legislature has worked since 2013 and been found guilty by the highest courts in the state and the highest court in the land of engaging in racism, surgical racism, intentional racism, gerrymandering racism. If that was happening before COVID-19, then surely in the midst of COVID-19, to open up this society would first mean to close these inequalities because pandemics live, breathe, and exploit the fissures, the divisions, and the inequalities of our society. Thank you so much. Dr. Garrett. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by observing that the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services has provided a breakdown, a racial breakdown of the incidence and the mortality from COVID-19. Uh, you must keep in mind that Blacks constitute approximately 22% of the state's population, while Whites constitute about 71% of the state's population. Out of the 5,700 5, confirmed cases of COVID-19, 32% are cases that have been associated with Black folks and 53% with White folks. Out of the 237 deaths that have been attributed to COVID-19, 37% have been associated with Black folks and 59% with white folks. So there's an immense disparity in both the incidence and the mortality from the disease in the state of North Carolina. And if we would drill down to one of the counties where race, race data is collected, Mecklenburg County, where Blacks constitute about 31% of the county's population. Blacks are also 44% of the COVID-19 cases and 50% of the deaths. Uh, this is not unique to North Carolina. For example, if we looked at the state of Louisiana, we would find that it's a state where the Black percentage of the population is, is, is 32, but the Black percentage of the deaths from COVID-19 is an astronomical 70%. Now, what are the causes of these disparities? Well, first, it's attributable to greater exposure to the virus due to employment characteristics among Black Americans. So Black Americans are about 13% of the nation's overall population, but we do a disproportionate amount of, this, of the nation's missionary or care work. And this missionary and care work requires people to in, be involved in a high degree of personal contact in the provision of personal services. So at, at the national level, Blacks are in the vicinity of 30% of home health services workers, nursing care facility workers, uh, residential care facility workers. 22% of community food, housing, and emergency services workers, and in excess of 30% of taxi drivers and bus drivers and other transportation-related service workers in the United States. So as a consequence, Blacks are more likely to be in occupations where there's a greater risk of exposure to the coronavirus. The second consideration is, as a legacy of the way in which racial injustice has been manifest in the United States, Blacks have a disproportionate incidence of pre-existing conditions that make you more vulnerable to having uh, incurred the infection. Uh, and these include hypertension, diabetes, and uh, a variety of other types of heart disease-related illnesses. These pre-existing conditions mean that if somebody contracts the virus, they are going to be more likely to have 
a more severe reaction to it. But third, there is a more fundamental pre-existing condition that underlies the health attributes that I've just mentioned. And this more fundamental uh, pre-existing condition has to do with disparities in resources that are best captured by looking at racial differences in access to wealth in the United States. So as I said, constitute about 13% of the nation's population, but only possess about 2.6% of the nation's wealth. This translates into a gap across black and white households of an approximate uh, $800,000 per household on average. And this is a staggering differential, and it means that black families consistently have far fewer resources to protect themselves in emergency situations like a pandemic or in more ordinary emergency situations, such as job loss on the part of a breadwinner in their family. Under the current pandemic, the scope of job loss is going to be immense. It already is evidenced by the fact that uh, in, in late March, there were 113,000 new, un, new unemployment insurance claims in the state of North Carolina in a single week, which constituted the equivalent of eight months of claims that took place in North Carolina during 2019. I would argue further that it's important that we understand that in addition to the emergency measures that Dr. Anthony Spearman, Dr. Dr. Reverend Dr. Spearman talked about, it's important that we address a certain array of national programs that are essential. If these national programs had been in place at the onset of the pandemic, we would have been better positioned to cope with uh, to cope with the effects of this of this of this tragedy. Um, but even though they're not in place yet, there's nothing that prevents us as a country from adopting these emergency measures. And I would include among these, first of all, and, and this may seem like something that's extremely simple, but uh, in its simplicity, it's very powerful. And that is uh, having universal access to, uh, to Wi-Fi or to broadband. Uh, if we had such universal access, it would even permit us to vote on a remote basis, and it could ensure that we could have widespread access to the voting process, in addition to the widespread access to the internet. In addition, we need to have a national health services, national health insurance program. Uh, the United States appears to be the only country among those that we identify as developed that has never taken the step of providing a full-scale national health insurance program. In addition, we need a federal job guarantee for all Americans, an assurance that every American citizen who is an adult will be able to obtain employment at, uh, at a pay rate above the poverty level and with compensation that includes uh, a benefits package that would be comparable to that which is provided to all federal civil servants, that that assurance or guarantee should be provided to all adult Americans through public service employment. And finally, we also must have a policy that addresses the specific debt that is owed to Black Americans, Black American descendants of United States slavery, because the origins of this immense wealth gap that I'm describing takes place with the failure to provide the formerly enslaved with the promised 40 acres in the aftermath of the Civil War. And indeed, at the same time that Blacks were denied 40 acre land grants, Whites were getting 160 acre land grants throughout the western part of the United States via the Homestead Acts. And so that's the origins or the beginnings of the huge wealth disparity that I've, that I've, that I've mentioned. We need a reparations program to eliminate the black-white wealth gulf. We need a comprehensive national program to close the gap. And to make use of the title of my new book that's co-authored with Kirsten Mullen, we can say that what we are driving at is achieving the goal of moving us from here to equality. 
these policies that I've just described will accomplish that aim. Thank you, Dr. Darity. We will now <clears throat> go to Reverend Lynch to give closing remarks. My colleagues today, Dr. Spearman has outlined some powerful, simple points. Dr. Barber has laid out our plight. Dr. Darity has continued to lift us in that direction. We are all here today asking for our state to take the lead in this nation in doing what is right. That's all we are after. It is time to come to an end to surgical racism, time to bring an end to gerrymandering. But in the midst of this health crisis, it is our responsibility to make sure that the members, of the citizens of the state of North Carolina, our 100 counties that reach from the beautiful mountains to the beautiful coast, have a right to health, have a right to life and survival. So we're calling upon our elected officials. Our governor was elected. Our legislature, you were elected, not just to speak on behalf of your party, but to speak on behalf of all citizens of this state, beyond race, beyond class, beyond all of the things that we use to divide us. We're asking our governor to lead from the front. We're asking our legislature. Next week, when you come together, these things can be put in place. The items that Dr. Spearman has outlined, one by one, would save so many lives. Now, one of the things about the people on the call today, this, this video conference, I'm, I'm a pastor, Dr. Spearman, Dr. Barber. In addition to what we do in speaking up for those that are least and left out, we have to deal with the families and when we have to bury some of the persons as a result from these disparities. We're trying to help people to live and live in a beautiful state that speaks to all persons. So help us, please. We need unity, but most of all from our governor and our elected officials, we need courageous leadership in these times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Lynch. We will now open the floor to questions. I am also in the chat box pasting a link to a copy of the full plan that's been discussed here today. And if you all have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat box and we will call on may, folks one by one to ask may, questions. May I make one comment? This is Reverend Dr. Barbara. Absolutely. That I forgot. One of the reasons, particularly in the South, and our state, North Carolina, has to act uh, as much as it can act, and is that we just saw a fourth bill passed in the United States Congress and put on the president's desk. And many, and 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 that bill, four bills, more than three point three trillion dollars, that's primarily going to corporations and businesses. Three trillion dollars in a country that has 140 million poor and low wealth people. 61% of all African Americans are poor and low wealth. That's 26 million people. Uh, 39, uh, about somewhere between 27, 30% of whites are poor and low wealth. 66 million people. And 80 million people are either underinsured or not insured. Three, four bills, Dr. Spearman. And not one bill addressed poverty and racial disparity, not even for whites, but, but, but surely not the combination of poverty and race. Four bills, and not one of them guaranteed health care, even for frontline workers. Four bills, not one of them guaranteed living wages. Four bills, not one of them guaranteed sick leave. Four bills, not one of them guaranteed that people's rent would be forgiven and they would not have to after three months of forgiveness, pay the three months and the four months, four bill, and not one bill uh, guaranteed that utilities wouldn't be shut off. Four bills, and not sufficient money to protect the right to vote. Four bills, $3 trillion, 
So we must say finally that we align in this country when we say we don't have the money. We have the money. And anybody in the legislature that comes back and says, well, we've got to raise taxes. We've passed four bills and given $3 trillion and treated corporations like people and people like things. And, in, and we have money in our bloated defense budget that, that we could use and we would still, still, still be the most powerful military by far. More money than Iran, Iraq, North Korea, and China put together. The question is, whether or not we're going to have bloated defense budget and whether or not we're going to continue to give tax bucks to, to the wealthy or whether we're going to defend our people from death and whether or not we're going to care about this entire society. And we are in a situation where if you do not lift everybody, everybody has a right to live. And if they don't, we don't. So I wanted to just emphasize why the state has to act in this moment. Thank you, Reverend Barber, for the, thank you for the, the powerful address. We will now open it up for questions. If any members of the media have questions, now is the time. Thank you. Are you hear, hearing it, hearing now? I am not seeing any in the chat. Okay. We'll give folks a few more moments. All right, this will be our last call for questions. If we are having any issues with the chat box, you all please let us know. Otherwise, we will thank you for participating. Okay, we have one question. Reverend Barber and Reverend Spearman, would you all be able to address the historic coming together of the General Baptist for in this moment? Well, the General Baptist Convention has always been with us. I mean, that's a, it's a historic con uh, a connection, faith and people of faith. Uh, Reverend Dr. Leonzo Lynch is in a grand tradition of pastors who also understand the prophetic call, not a partisan call, not a political call, but the prophetic call uh, to care for the least of these. And the fact of the matter is um, all people of faith should be following Dr. Lynch's uh, um, leadership. He is the leader of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of members and churches who read that Bible that, said, that has over 2,000 scriptures in that Bible that says how we treat the poor, how we treat the sick, how we treat children, how we treat the least of these is the true measure of our worship and our faith and our moral uh, 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 capacity. And so it's a long tradition and we're just, I'm honored certainly to stand with Dr. Lynch who's been a friend for many, many years. Definitely, I think that uh, Dr. Lynch alluded to it earlier. Um, Oftentimes, and Dr. Lynch is the uh, leader of his, the General Baptist State Convention, he's often attending to other things. One of the things that I think is not so clear to um, those who don't look like us is how much we have to multitask as we are uh, dealing with things that come down upon us as a community of people. And Dr. Lynch is all oftentimes in the field when, when uh, doing the 
great work when we are taking care of this kind of business. So he's always, they've always, they're always with us. This is, this is not historic. This is, I mean, this is our brother being able to be with us because of this pandemic largely. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, as we all are being uh, shut in, uh, he's, he's available to us. So, you know, and, and visible. So he's, uh, this is not new to us. How many churches, Dr. Lynch? General mm -hmm. Baptist, we is across our 100 counties, we have 57 district associations and approximately 1,580 churches. Wow. Which would represent approximately half a million Black Baptists in North Carolina. And so today, the media should know you have three denominational bodies, the General Baptist State Convention, Dr. Spearman, AME Zion, and myself uh, with the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Um, so you have three denominational bodies. And even though the Christian Church Disciples of Christ is predominantly in membership white, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ has a strong social justice and anti-racist <clears throat> mentality uh, um, in, in, in this country and in this world. Thank you. The next question, how can we gain the support of those Black people that are in middle income to become involved in poor people's issues? Um, well, the reality is, if you're talking about Black people, first of all, 61% are poor and low income. We have to redefine poverty. Sometimes we think poverty is just the person on the street, but there are 140 million people in this country who live less than $400 away from an economic catastrophe. And what we need all people to realize in black and white, regardless, is that you cannot have a society where you have 43% of that society living in poverty and low income and think ultimately that society will survive. Not only is it constitutionally inconsistent and morally indefensible, it's economically insane. And the same is true in this state. You, you know, I want people to hear this. 48% of North Carolinians are poor and low wealth, 48%. 56% of all our children. Those numbers should cause every preacher and every elected official and every public policy official to literally tremble inside of our consciousness and run to whatever power we have to seek to make a difference. Those numbers are atrocious in the wealthiest nation in the country. And so we live by a creed that, that, that we should be concerned, you know, in particular in the black community, one of the things that we learned, because Harriet Tubman and Frederick Gluggins, because they, did, they got out of slavery, they didn't just say, well, I'm no longer concerned about the system of slavery. In fact, they used their position to fight it even the more. And so we have a requirement to do that regardless of our economic status uh, in this state, but particularly those of us who may have some advantage and may have some, uh, um, you know, I often say it like this, those of us who have a home to stay in, doing stay in place must fight for those who have no home to stay in. Those of us who have health care must fight for those who need health care. Uh, we are told in our faith tradition uh, that we are required to care for our brothers and sisters, and if we don't, we shall be judged as a nation, as a state, and as individuals for not doing so. Thank you. The next question that we are seeing, uh, could you all address what call, if any, you are making to the public to participate in the April 28th and 29th special session next week in the legislature? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we are waiting is to see how those that that is going to be handled. We don't. One of the things we have been uh, saying to our communities, our people, is that we don't want to jump the gun with this reopening of the state of North Carolina, and so we're we're not going to advise you to come, go to Raleigh to the if they have a, a general assembly. We don't want you to do that. We are waiting to hear how things are going to pan out so that we will know and be able to advise you how you can be involved, uh, probably virtually, in the uh, opening of the General Assembly on, the, on that day. Thank you. Everybody has a telephone and an email. And Dr. Spearman, I know he can get you every, every email. And, and, and we can, you know, those are online. And we, got, we, can, we may be staying at home and staying in place, but we don't have to stay un inactive. You can 
can use that cell phone, use that email, and follow the lead that Dr. Spirit and NAACP lays out. If they tell us to call, let's call every legislature. If they tell us to write an email, let's write those emails. Whatever they instruct us to do, we need to be about letting our voices be heard. Because this matter right now is no longer about left and right and Democrat and Republican. This is about life and death. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, I'm sitting here right now with a pot and a ladle. And uh, often we've heard a great deal about some of the, globally speaking, about uh, those in uh, Italy, Spain, and other places doing their utmost best to, at a certain time of the evening, to go out on their balconies and to applaud those workers who are out there putting themselves on the, uh, in the front lines of, of this matter. You know, their lives are in jeopardy and they're applauding the acts of those persons. I, I think that's something that I want to say that we probably need to mimic uh, and, and, and not only mimic it for the essential workers, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking right now about a call that I received the other day from a mother whose daughter is incarcerated in Swannanoa Correctional Facility. She is uh, seven months away from being released, but she's suffering from cancer. And uh, some of the nodules have resurfaced and they've spoken to the nurses, but she's not been able to get the attention of anyone to take a look at her case and to say, you know, this is a person that we believe needs to be released from the prison so, so that she can get the proper care that she needs and not to be susceptible and vulnerable to this pandemic, but that hasn't occurred yet. So I, I would say that we need, to get the, we need to get our pots and our ladles and make a joyful noise unto the Lord on behalf of those individuals who are, who are in the prison system, have, have virtually not committed, some of them have not even committed crimes, been, uh, been, been com convicted of any crimes, but yet and still they are there without the benefit of social distancing and their lives are becoming more and more vulnerable every day. We need to really begin sounding the alarm to this, these, this government to say, you need to do the right thing. And especially in this election year, where many of you, many of you need to remember and recall that it was many of us who got you into the places where you are right now. So let's keep those things in mind. Dr. Spearman, I wanna say one more thing before I and join you in that. I live in a county where a few weeks ago we thought there might be 20 cases. We found out there were 370 cases inside of a minimum security prison. That means nobody in there had a license and we don't promote the death penalty anyway because we've seen multiple times when people have been freed from the death penalty who were innocent. But we, you know, people also forget that if the prisoners are infected, so will the guards and the sure. administrator and the cleaners. There's a study out that talks about how many people outside of the prison, one person inside of the prison can affect. Now, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter because uh, nobody should be sentenced to death simply because of a germ of nature. But we need to deal with that seriously. And I want to suggest several or two other things we should be doing. We need to say to the media, because you're going to be told this by legislators, well, the churches just need to do charitable work. Charitable work alone is not going to fix this. All of our churches are doing charitable work. We're feeding 370 kids a, a, a day, but that does not give people health care. That does not give people a living wage. Those are policy issues. And our state, by constitution, is required to, 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 to care for the poor and the least of these and to, to ensure that everybody has what they need to have the right to life, liberty, and the enjoyment of the fruit of their own life. That's in the Constitution. We need, what you can do, we can partner with the government and have some of our fellowship halls turned into testing sites, right? We need hospitals in areas, field hospitals. We have all these bases here. The Corps, Army Corps of Engineers in North Carolina could be placing field hospitals in critical rural and urban areas where they do not have access to hospitals like down in, um, um, uh, on the other side of Washington in Bell Haven, where the hospital was closed because of greed. We, we should, those are things that we have to have governmental policy, leadership, vision, and imagination to make happen. 
And that is why this legislature cannot merely come back and the governor cannot merely um, um, call for those things that are, quote, practical, because this is not a moment for to do what is practical. This is the moment to solve problems, to solve problems with bold action. Thank you, Reverend Barber. We have a question that came through via email um, regarding the some of the criminal justice and court reforms that are happening in Asheville as a result of COVID. And they want to know um, people that are being held on minor charges are being released and police are not arresting people for petty crimes. They want to know how do you think these efforts are going? Are they being done properly? And do you think these changes should be made permanent through legislative change at the local, state, or federal level? That's our lawyer. Caitlin? Reverend Spearman and Reverend Barber, uh, Dr. Lynch, um, a week, I can address this very briefly and also address an, an issue that I think uh, Dr. Spearman was speaking to. On Tuesday, the North Carolina NAACP is one among a group of plaintiffs who has brought a challenge in Superior Court uh, that will be heard on Tuesday. Uh, raising constitutional challenges to the conditions in North Carolina prisons uh, that people who are currently incarcerated are facing today unlawfully in this state. Uh, and we believe that uh, the, the governor um, and the um, uh, Department of Public Safety, uh, as well as other actors in the state system, uh, have much to do to ensure that uh, they, they are fulfilling their mandate uh, to provide safe conditions for those who are currently incarcerated. And this week alone, we have heard from uh, at least two people who we've been in contact with uh, who had come to us uh, through Reverend Spearman uh, and others uh, in the community praying for relief from the conditions that they were in in uh, North Carolina's prisons, uh, asking for uh, the, the governor and others to take action uh, to preserve their lives. Uh, both of them now have, have tested positive for coronavirus. Um, I believe uh, that the questioner uh, that, that uh, just came through by email is speaking to county by county efforts that are being taken uh, by, by brave uh, individuals in the criminal justice system, uh, district attorneys, um, sheriffs, uh, 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 city council members, uh, judges who are coming together to try to solve this problem at the local level to address what we know is, is uh, the science tells us, which is that in these congregate living uh, facilities, uh, the county at the county level, um, in, in jails uh, and detention centers, and at the statewide level in our state prisons, uh, the current conditions where we have overcrowding and, uh, and overcriminalization of individuals across the state uh, that has resulted in that overcrowding means that these prisons and these county jails do not have the ability to preserve social distancing as the CDC recommends. Uh, and that is why Reverend Spearman and, and uh, Reverend Barber, Reverend Lynch have come together today and emphasized that those conditions must be addressed immediately. Uh, as to fees and fines and criminal debt, I understand that that is also a portion of uh, the uh, proposal that was released today in the recovery plan. And of course, uh, Reverend uh, Spearman and Reverend Barber and Reverend Lynch have long been in support uh, of ending uh, uh, criminal justice debt that is not tied to anything but the criminalization of poverty. Um, I, I, I'm happy to answer additional questions um, about specific litigation if that would be helpful. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, there was one question that came through about the census and I want to encourage everybody under the sound of my voice on this live streaming that you that take the time, please, sir, please, ma'am, to do go online or uh, adhere to the mailing that you receive and send your census document back in. Um, the more the more people that apply, the better it is for your community, your respective communities, and we need to make sure that we all count. Everybody counts and. Uh, 
nobody's left out of that. I mean, if you have someone living in your home that's undocumented, they count. So please, sir, please, ma'am, make sure you fill out your census documents and get that done while you have the time and the flexibility to do so. I am really appreciative for this, uh, this gathering and for the opportunity to share with those who have joined us um, and I pray that we're all uh, doing our best to stay safe and to protect those whom we love. I have had news from various parts of this world that I have loved ones all over who have fallen victim to this coronavirus. And um, I have one cousin in, in Connecticut who is at the throes of death um, with bacteria in his lungs. And we are praying fervently that God would raise him up off of the sick bed of affliction. But we know that um, if we stick together through this, if we would adhere to the mandates where th that say stay at home, when we say stay at home, we're asking you please to stay at home, to adhere to our voices. Don't fall prey to the madness that's saying you have to get back to work, you have to get back. No, you don't have to get back to work. Don't be a test tube. Don't be a guinea pig. Stay at home, please. And let's see how this thing pans out. There was a question about whether or not we believe that the governor will extend the date of the stay at home date from May 8th. We will we will, you know, the jury's still out. We will check it out and we will see when that day comes. But until then, please, please adhere to the mandates. I can't, I cannot emphasize that anymore. Thank you, Mr. I, I, mm -hmm. I think that you're, you're exactly right. And as an active pastor, I have one family that has 10 family members, five who died, four who are fighting, one who thinks they have it, but they can't even get tested. A classmate that had seven people in their family, seven and growing. This is serious business. And do not believe these folk who are lying and saying we are ready to go back. It is an invitation to death. It's yes, it an invitation is. to infection. Um, and then Craig Caitlin said something a minute ago, and the media, is, it's important for you to pick up on this. We have been sounding the alarm for years about these inequities and people can cover them up. But when a pandemic comes, it's like a contrast dye that you put in your body when you get certain kinds right. of, of x-rays. Right. And so a lot of the things should have been done. Now the question is, will we do what yeah. must be done? Um, and because what we cannot have and I'm so thankful for Dr. Spearman's leadership and Dr. Lynch's leadership. We cannot allow people in power to be comfortable with other people's deaths. We just can't allow that anymore. We, in, in every way we can, with a moral framework, must discomfort the comfortable. Too many people are saying about this pandemic, it's, it's there, it's those people. And that's what we cannot have because it puts all of us at risk, at risk. Uh, 50,000 deaths in last, less than two months. If you multiply that times six, that could be 300,000 people if it continued at this rate. This is serious. A lot of it didn't have to be this. It's, it's government negligence from the top. It, it would, the germ is one thing, but the negligence, and the disease of greed and division and inequality are the things that have caused it to be as horrific as it is. But we have a chance. And North Carolina, as Dr. Spear used to say something like this, I think it was, we, we went first in flight, we need to be first in justice, first in equality, first in being the first Southern state to go ahead and expand healthcare, the first Southern state to, to do right by the essential workers. Let's lead the way, North Carolina. Thank you. I have one final question. 
And that is, could you all address if there's a message of hope for people who are currently incarcerated in North Carolina who are facing grave danger and also those who are suffering due to the impoverishment that's been caused by this pandemic? Well, the only hope, I, the hope that I talk about is the hope that Dr. King spoke of, is he said, hope is when we hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. The only hope that I know of in a moment like this, certainly the hope that we have in a God that has everything, but the greatest hope that people have now, can have in this moment, particularly those who are sick and those who are incarcerated, is when they hear of that we are fighting to change things. Um, um, the reality is all of us right now need to ask this question, I think, this is my humble opinion. If I knew that I was 48 hours from a ventilator, which is where you can be at any moment in the midst of this COVID, 48 hours from a ventilator, and if I knew I was possibly 48 hours from taking my last breath on this side of existence, what would I want to use my last breaths for? Mm -hmm. What kind of health care would I want to fight for? What kind of world? What kind of mercy? What kind of grace? What kind of love? I think all of us need to take a soul check right now and, and then decide that the hope we're going to exhibit is being about the business of standing for what's right and calling for what's right and saying that I, I'm going to act as though I'm headed toward my last breath. Because in a real sense, we all are in some way. And with the breaths that I have, I'm going to try to breathe some justice and some love and some grace and some mercy and some caring and some health care and some living wages into this society. And if we do that, there's something miraculous about walking by faith and walking according to what you believe that gives you a sense of hope, a sense that you don't just have to sit down and do nothing and say nothing and be nothing. So my prayer is that people will join the work that produces hope, which is the work of justice. Thank you. Uh, we thank you all for participating and we will follow up with a link to the recording of this as well as a link to the full plan that was discussed here today. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Brittany. Thanks. Thank you all. God bless you all.